Good afternoon. I'm Carolyn Souza, and I'll be reading A Splash of Red, The Life and Art of Horace Pippin for you this afternoon. On February 22nd, 1888, the town of Westchester, Pennsylvania, celebrated a holiday. That day in that same town, Daniel and Kristen Pippin celebrated the birth of their son, Horace. Horace grew fast, so fast that his mother could barely keep up with the mending. He'll be a giant someday, the neighbors would say. Grandma Pippin smiled at Horace's long legs and big hands. She figured the neighbors were right. Grandma's hands were big too, rough and scarred from her slave days in Virginia. But they were just fine for giving Horace hugs. The biggest part of you, she told him, is inside where no one can see. When Horace was three years old, the Pippins moved to Goshen, New York. As the family grew larger, everyone helped out. Horace put his big hands to work. He fetched flour for his mother. He sorted laundry with his sisters. He played with his baby brother. He held the horse while the driver delivered milk. At night, he piled wood for the stove and arranged dominoes so his grandmother could play. Then, if he could find a scrap of paper and a piece of charcoal, he drew pictures of what he'd seen that day. Horace loved to draw. He loved the feel of the charcoal as it slid across the floor. He loved looking at something in the room and making it come alive in front of him. He loved thinking about a friend or a pet, then drawing them from the picture in his mind. At school, he sat quietly at his desk, but his big hands were always busy. Make a picture for us, Horace, his classmate said, and Horace did. His pictures made people happy, except when he made some next to his spelling list. That made the teacher mad. But Horace couldn't stop drawing. One day, Horace saw a funny face in a magazine. Draw me and win a prize, it said underneath. Horace drew the face and sent it off. A few weeks later, a package arrived. Inside, Horace found colored pencils, a pair of brushes, and a box of paints. Congratulations, said the note. Horace had won his first real art supplies. Paint a picture for us, Horace, his sisters cried, and Horace did. He painted everyday scenes in natural colors. Then he added a splash of red. Horace was in eighth grade when his father left for good. The family needed money, so Horace quit school and went to work. For several years, Horace's big hands were always busy, stacking grain sacks at a feed store, shoveling coal at a rail yard mending fences on a farm, carrying luggage at a hotel, making breaks in an iron factory, packing oil paintings into large wooden crates. Looking at these made Horace remember winning the art contest, how proud he'd been, how he'd loved those colored pencils, those brushes, and his first real box of paints. Horace was a big man now, with big responsibilities. Still, he loved drawing as much as he always had. He used charcoal, broken pencils, whatever he could find. Make a picture for us, Horace, the other worker said, and Horace did. Far across the ocean, a terrible war had begun. Horace's big heart wanted to help. He joined the army and sailed away. In France, Horace and his regiment dug deep trenches for protection. There were no blankets or beds. It was always wet and cold and dark. I have not seen the sun in more than a month, Horace wrote. He wrapped his big hands around a rifle, 
planes droned overhead, shells exploded, gunfire rattled through the night. If the fighting stopped for a while, Horace put down his gun and picked up a pencil. Make a picture for us, Horace, his soldier friends pleaded. And Horace did. He filled his notebooks one by one. One day, he climbed to the top of the trench. A shot rang out. Horace felt pain in his shoulder. He was hit. Many hours passed before help came. Horace was glad to be alive, but the bullet had badly damaged his right arm. When it healed, he couldn't lift or move it the way he used to. Now, when someone said, make a picture for us, Horace, Horace could not. After the war, Horace came back to the United States and met Jenny Wade. Jenny was a hard worker. She loved to cook. Horace was a hard worker, too, and he loved to eat. It was a good match. They married and settled down in Westchester. Horace was 32 years old, as big and as strong as ever. But because of his injured arm, he couldn't find a job. How much can you lift, the hiring boss asked. And that was the end of that. So Horace did what he could. He organized a Boy Scout troop. He umpired baseball games. He took the neighbor's children fishing. When Jenny started a laundry business, Horace delivered the clean clothes. As he walked along the streets of Westchester, his fingers itched to draw all the colors and textures he saw. Lacy white curtains billowing in the windows, a splash of red geraniums blooming on a step a yellow cat sprinting down an alley, dark green vines spiraling up a wall. At night, his old home in Goshen, his grandmother's slave days, and the Bible story she told made pictures in his mind. He longed to draw them too. But how? His right arm was weak and painful to lift. The iron poker stood by the stove, straight and tall as a soldier. Could he, with his left hand, he grasped his right wrist. He thrust the poker into the flames until it glowed red hot. Using his good arm to move the hurt one, he scorched lines into the wood. Make a picture for us, Horace, the neighbor said, and Horace did. With practice, his arm grew stronger, his hand steadier. Maybe now, he told Jenny, I can try painting. There was no money for art supplies, so Horace used an old brush and leftover house paint he found in the alleys. For a canvas, he used a clean piece of cloth. Every day and late into the night, Horace worked on his painting. He used gray, black, and white, the somber colors of war. Here and there, he added a splash of red. He used 100 layers of paint. He decorated the frame with tiny sculptures. Three years later, he finished. Now, as he delivered laundry or fished in the river, new ideas came, but he didn't paint them right away. Before he reached for a brush, Horace planned each new scene in his head. He painted the milkman and his wagon, women working in the kitchen, children playing games in the yard, cotton fields and log cabins, John Brown and Abraham Lincoln, war scenes and Bible tales, men singing on the corner. Horace hung his paintings in shoe store windows. Five dollars each, said the sign. He hung others in a restaurant. He even traded one for a haircut. People admired Horace's paintings, 
but no one bought them. Then the president of a local arts club saw Horace's pictures. He told his friend, the famous painter N.C. Wyeth, to come and see them too. Wyeth agreed. Horace's paintings were good, very good. Do you have more, the men asked. Horace showed them his work. He held his breath as they looked and talked. Finally, they said, you should have your own art show, a one-man exhibition right here in Westchester. Horace could hardly believe it. He shook hands with the man. When they left, he celebrated with Jenny. People came from all around to see Horace's paintings. Magazines wrote articles. Reporters took photos. An art dealer told Horace he would help him sell his work. More than 40 years had passed since Horace won his first box of paints. Now at last, everyone knew he was an artist. Horace became famous. His paintings hung in big city galleries. Museums displayed them. Collectors admired them. Movie stars bought them. Once again, Horace's big hands were always busy. And if you stood outside his house late at night, you might see him leaning toward his easel, his left hand holding up his right, painting the pictures in his mind. <laughs>